Hi everyone, it's such a joy to be able to be here with you and share with you God's word this morning. Uh, my name is Mwangi Mudui, some people call me T, and it's a joy just to be able to come and share with you what God has laid in my heart. Um, I'm a husband to Marion Jay Wanyueke, one wife. I have two kids, Tugi, um, who's about three, and TJ, who's about one. Um, and it's just exciting being able to be part of this renewal family and share with us God's word today. Allow me to jump into what we'll be looking at today. And start off with, with an interesting discussion I found myself in within the last week. Um, so a few days ago, uh, I was with a group of friends and, and we ended up in this conversation and discussion around whether if you were in an interview panel for your organization and you have these two finalists left and, and they are a bit different in that one has super high competencies, um, the highest level of qualification for their role, but their character is a bit wanting. And this other has an amazing character and reputation and references, but their qualifications are not as good. Who would you end up picking? And it was interesting that a majority of the people chose the latter, the one who, whose character was so sound and so strong. And their logic was that, you know, competency can always be built. It can always be trained, it can always be developed. Um, you can always have team members even cover up for each other where competency is lacking. But character is the one thing that, you know, if it's not there, it's not there. And you'll end up with such a big gap, but it's toxic. It destroys the organization. It destroys team chemistry. And as that conversation was going on, in fact, the few who had chosen the first pass of the one whose competency was high ended up being swayed. And it hit me at that time as I'm hearing people go through this back and forth that the world has such a high premium it places on character. That we all actually have a value we we have for character. I mean, if, if right now we were, and I hope this would be how we would vote, if we were in an election and, and you have candidates, some who have high competency but poor character, it's shown us time and time again in different countries how that kind of leadership destroys countries. Um, because it doesn't matter the level of knowledge. In fact, uh, there's a former US president, um, Calvin Coolidge, who's quoted as saying, the world does not need more knowledge, it needs more character. So if this is such a universally accepted thing, does God hold the same premium for character as we do? Does God hold the same premium for, for things like honesty, kindness, integrity? Does the Bible hold them in the same high regard? And the answer to this is yes. If you look at the New Testament in multiple occasions, it refers to this element of what we're calling character, a godly kind of character as the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And today we'll be looking at a passage in Galatians 5 that takes time to build on what is this fruit of the Holy Spirit? What is this godly character? And what is God's desire and plan for it? You know, the word fruit is interesting. It's interesting that the Bible chooses to use fruit to talk about godly character. Because if I plant a seed today, um, as much as I believe I have planted a mango seed, the only way I will ever really be sure that it was a mango seed I planted was the day I have a fruit and I cut in and it's a mango fruit. God uses the word fruit because character will open, it will swell out of what is inside, what has been planted in us. And God is saying if we have the fruit of the Holy Spirit, if inside us is planted the Holy Spirit, then what will pour out of us will be godly character. And that's what we want to take some time to look at and, and, and see it from God's perspective. It's interesting that the world holds this and God holds it in such a high premium, yet over and over, more and more, you keep finding, you keep finding the church and, and Christians and, and engaging and holding in higher regard things like theological doctrine, things like uh, piety, spirituality, and, and having such a small regard for, for character. You keep finding people being appointed into church leadership positions whose character is so wanting, but because they have the highest theological uh, qualifications, then that, that's enough. Yet we know that's not enough in the world context. And we know that's not enough in God's view. So how do we reconcile this? You know, there's, there's a theologian who used to say that Christian character is hidden inside us. It's like a waiter who's carrying a, a bowl and it's until he's hit and it spills is when you know what was inside that bowl, is when you know what soup was there. And it's until we are hard pressed 
It's until we're in traffic being cut off by someone who's overlapping. It's until we're in a difficult time with a boss. It's until we're in a relationship and driving each other nuts. The truth of what is inside us, what our character is, begins to pour out. And in those instances, it is not theological knowledge or Bible quotes that, that, that come out. It's the how much we've integrated those things into us that they have built a character that pours out. And this is one we want to look at for the next couple of weeks. We're beginning a series on the unsexy fruit of the Holy Spirit. Being able to ask ourselves these things that we don't like to talk about too much, that we don't want to, to write in our New Year's resolutions as the things we want to work on for the year. What does God think about them and how do they start becoming real in my life? And so let me allow us to turn to, to Galatians chapter 5, verse 16 to 26. And look at that passage that we'll be looking at today. Allow me to read it out for us. But I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For those are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. Now, the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of rage, anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the likes. I warn you as I warned you before that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. It's interesting, the first thing that jumps to me from that passage is that I think the reason why we often don't see godly characters as much as we would like to the reason why it's not a common conversation that we are engaging in on a day to day the reason why the fruit of the spirit is not so obvious is because perhaps we have not remembered and realized that there is a battle of leadership over our lives and over our character that is taking place every day and that passage makes it clear that there are two opposing leaders who are so different but both fighting and wanting to have a chance to lead your life. The first leader is the one you're born with. And he's the de facto leader. He's the, he's the one who comes. It's like the default setting on an appliance when you buy a gadget. The default setting, the default leader, the Bible sometimes calls flesh, sometimes calls um, uh, sinful nature. And he has always led us from birth. And it is what has always determined our choices, our decisions. And it's what leads this world. And it's why this world is full of what is called obvious. What Paul refers to in Galatians as, as those list of things that are very obvious around us that cause a fallen and sinful world. And on the other side is the Holy Spirit. And we came from a series on the Holy Spirit where we looked at the fact that when we accept Jesus Christ, God gives us the Holy Spirit to lead us and guide us. But that leadership is in a battle against each other. And the question for us is then, if this battle is going on, how do we end up with the Holy Spirit leading us so that then what is coming out is the fruit of the Holy Spirit? It's so interesting uh, that, that we don't often realize that someone actually is ruling over our lives. That someone is actually leading our lives. And sometimes when we realize this, we feel a bit helpless. We feel a bit out of control. And especially when we realize how different these two leaders are. Some of us do know there's a battle for leadership of our lives going on. But we think that this battle is one-off. And so the day we give our lives to Christ, that's it. And we don't need to daily engage in our minds and in our hearts and in our choices and in our commitments to allow the leader we want to lead our lives. And so we, we do this one time and what happens? The de facto leader comes back to lead our lives. And we end up back in the cycle of being led by our flesh and of our sinful desires. Some of us choose not to think about it and we decide, you know what, let's, let's just live life. You know, it can't be that bad. 
And unfortunately, choosing not to make a decision is making a decision because already we come with a default leader in us. But if we're going to have a conversation over the next few weeks about godly character and looking at some of those fruits, some of those godly characters, then we must begin by asking ourselves, because we can't engage in those conversations if we've not first and foremost allowed that what is planted in us is the Holy Spirit. So we need to engage and ask ourselves, how do we, in this battle, allow that the one leading us, the one who's won the battle, is the Holy Spirit? The passage then goes on to point out to us that it's almost that we must allow a coup to happen, a coup of leadership to happen in our lives, where this default leader is overthrown and we then put in a new leader. You see, from the time Adam and Eve sinned, the sinful nature came upon us in this world, came upon every human, you and I, and that, that gave our lives over to sin. And it's until we, we go through a journey of, of trying to change that, that the fruit of the Holy Spirit begins being evident in our lives. You see, it's, it's very interesting. It reminds me a, a, a lot of, 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 of how we, 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 we fix roads in this, in, this, in this country. Where you find a pothole, I've always found it interesting. You find a pothole and then they come and cut a bigger hole around the pothole. And then they fill it up and then we believe that that fixes the road. And then the rains come and they wash away the filling we've put in and then what you have is a bigger portal than the one you started with. And, and that's, that's a lot of how we deal with character. We, we accept Jesus into our lives and we want to, 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 want to be godly, we want to grow in Christ-likeness. But we don't want to do a, a full overhaul change of our lives, of our systems, of how we're living our lives. But we want to do some, some patch-up work. And so we do it, and then we, we get upset, and we're like, okay, I'm, I'm done doing this, I'm, I'm done, I'm done lying, I'm done doing this. And then we, we put all the human effort we can master to try to overcome it, and then we end up falling again. And it's like a hamster on a wheel, and we're going round and round and round and round, and we're trying patch up work, but we're not trying to ultimately change who is leading our lives. And so we, 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 we want to exhibit certain character, but we can't. And it's because we have not changed the leadership that results in the character. But if we remember that we are in a battle, if we remember that there is a war going on in our lives each and every day from when we wake up, then we begin engaging with this a bit differently. You know, there's a story of, 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 a, of, a, of a warehouse that was being sold and this realtor had been desperate to get rid of this warehouse. He had been trying to sell it for so long. But it was so beaten up, doors had been stolen, windows broken, and it was dirty. And there was this day he was taking this person who seemed interested. And he was so desperate telling him, don't worry, we'll fix that door, we'll fix that window, we'll fix this up, we'll clean it up. Because he just wanted someone to want to buy it. And then this customer looks at him and says, oh, I don't care about that. Either way, when I buy it, I'm going to tear down the whole warehouse. All I'm interested in is the site. And that's the same approach God comes to us with. He's telling us, stop trying to, to fix these small things and, and you're getting so caught up with the fact that you're, you're in a cycle with some of these things that you've been struggling with over and over. I, I want you to just give me your whole sight, give me yourself and let me overrun it and build something new. It's the reason the Bible talks about the fact that we are, in, we are a new creation. The old has gone and the new has come. It's a complete new thing. And that happens by allowing the leader to be a completely new leader in our lives and so the new leadership comes into place and this passage goes on to look at what that would be looking like what would it look like to have the holy spirit leading us but even before looking at what it would look like the bigger question maybe some some of us may be asking is why why is this such a big deal to have the holy spirit leading us and paul there says if we are led by the holy spirit we're not under the law and let me help you understand why that's such a big deal. It's because when you're under the law, you're judged by the law. You're judged by the law of what is right and what is wrong. But when you're led by the Spirit, you're free. Because the Holy Spirit is the one guiding you to what to do. And His actions are always what is right. And so you have freedom in just doing what He is guiding you towards. And not having to get caught up with, am I doing what's right? Am I battle? You know, a constant battle between yourself. I remember there was a, there was a day... 
I was traveling late at night with some friends to, to some resort and we really got lost. So the, there was one last place off the main road where we turned and then we were given some scanty directions to the house we were going to and we got completely lost and it's pitch dark, there's no light anywhere. And, and all of a sudden I noticed that there's this car behind us that's been following us all through. And we tried to find our way for quite a while and every sort of turn we took in the middle of nowhere because we couldn't even see a road led us into another dead end. And it was not until we finally found some, some people in somewhere hidden in the bushes and had the courage to ask them, believing that they won't rob us, um, for directions. And they managed to get us to some lights which finally took us to where we were going. Is when we arrived at the gate and the car behind us, we realized, believed we knew where we were going and they were following us. And it's so interesting because this, this for me paints a picture for what it's like when we allow the Holy Spirit to lead us. You see, before the Holy Spirit leads us, our flesh and our, our sinful nature is as blind as we are. And what we're doing is, is getting lost together, believing my heart knows what is right for me. Believing my mind knows what is right for me. Believing the ways of this world know what is right for me. And then we get so frustrated. We get so angry. We get so depressed when we are caught up in these wrangles of sin. But it's because we've allowed a blind person to lead another blind person. But there is freedom when we allow the Holy Spirit to lead us. He who knows the direction. It's like those lights I could see in the wilderness. That guide you to what you desire. To what God desires for you. So how do we end up at this? It's very interesting to say, allow the Holy Spirit to lead you. But that sounds like one of these Christianese terms. What does this look like? How do I actually allow the Holy Spirit to lead you? It's, for me, it, 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 for those of you who have any sense of little computer knowledge, because mine is very small, it's like changing the entire operating system of a machine. And being able to scrap out deleting the old OS. But for those of you who know, Rebuilding a new operating system will need you to place in some command, put in some instructions, layer it over and over so that the computer can then do what you want it to do. And for us, building this new OS, building this new operating system will take time reading God's word. will take time in prayer. will take time in meditation. will take time in Christian community. will take time in surrounding ourselves with all these things so that finally there's an operating system that results in the right commands coming out. And it's not unless we start doing these things that the Holy Spirit begins to take over our lives. I don't know if you've ever seen someone ask how, how I mean, you hold a, a glass of juice um, and it's colored juice. And someone asks you, how do I empty this glass of juice and fill it with water without pouring out the juice? And it was so interesting the first time I saw the answer to that, where someone picked a jug of water and just poured, poured, poured in until all that was left was clear water. The juice had all poured out because of pouring in enough water. We need to pour in the Holy Spirit into us through God's word, through Christian community, through engaging in prayer, through meditating on, on God, through spending time worshiping God, such that our old default nature pours out and what is left is the clear water of the Holy Spirit leading us every day. My encouragement to us is to think about our own lives and if if we want this godly character, if we want to begin pursuing and having the fruit of the Holy Spirit oozing out of us, asking ourselves then, what is the tree, what is the seed that has been planted in us? Who is leading our lives? And are we willing today to put in the work to start relinquishing leadership to the Holy Spirit so that the fruit of the Holy Spirit can start oozing out of us? Allow me as I end to tell you a story of, of a little boy who used to, every time he's grounded in his room, jump out of his window through a, a tree that was right next and then go play with his friends. And one day he had his father telling his mom, ah, we're going to cut down this tree because it's not produced fruits for years. So the boy went and gathered some of the friends he'd play with and they went and got many apples and stuck them onto the tree. And so the father looks at it the next morning and he tells his wife, wow, this tree that has never borne fruit for all these years is full of fruit. And you know what's so amazing? It has apple fruits, yet it's a pear tree. What? is planted in you. Many of us are trying to portray the fruits of the Holy Spirit, trying to live like right Christians, and we are constantly failing, and it's evident in our failure, but it's because we have not started at step one, which is planting the Holy Spirit in us, giving him space to lead us, so that then what will ooze out of us is the fruit of the Holy Spirit. 
So as we begin this series of the unsexy fruit of the Holy Spirit, as we look at different ones of those fruits, my prayer for you is that each time you, we engage with one of them, we can engage with it realizing that the only way that will come to the fore of our lives is in daily surrender to the Holy Spirit. Thanks.